Hello, and welcome to this second installment of Caterpillar Webcasts focused on power generation. Uh, my, I'm the moderator. My name is Nicholas Kelch. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce your speaker. Michael Devine uh, has, been, has product and business development responsibilities for Caterpillar Electric Power Division and is acting utility applications expert. In, in Michael's 36 years with Caterpillar, he's been responsible for manufacturing, service engineering, product development, product management, as well as education and retraining responsibilities, so quite a wide range. Uh, Mike has developed utility projects around the world and is well known and respected throughout the electric power industry. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Michael. Uh, excuse me, before, before I do that, forgot about this part, we do want to ask you some questions, ask you to provide some information about you, about the audience and your cohorts there uh, attending this webcast. If you could go ahead, if you see the question, which of the below categories best describes your core business? Are you an engineering consultant, electric or gas utility, original equipment manufacturer or distributor, a large user of energy, government, military, or financial services? If you could just go ahead and pick the radio button and submit your answer, I will share the results of this with you uh, live. Here, I'll give you just a moment. And I'll go ahead and uh, show these results here with the audience. We can see we have quite a, a nice mix of different folks out there. Um, that's interesting to know. I appreciate your participation there. And one more question before we get to the survey as well. Um, do you see a business case for distributed generation with reciprocating engine technology? Uh, maybe you're not sure. Maybe you've had different information provided to you in the past. We're curious to know what your impression is here before we even get started. And if you could go ahead and submit your answers, I will also share the results here. Um, a lot of people say, yes, some skeptics, it looks like uh, some are here to learn, obviously. Uh, that's great to know. Okay, well, without further ado, um, I'll go ahead and I'll turn over presenting responsibilities to Mike Devine. Hello and welcome. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to come and visit with us today. I'd like to spend a little bit of time today talking about a couple of different topics related to the uh, traditional business of distributed generation, and particularly as it relates to electric utilities. I'd like to talk a little bit about the distributed generation opportunities with gensets, a little bit of an understanding about utility load distributions, uh, comparing purchase power and generation options, uh, particularly as it relates to peak demand, um, how utilities can optimize a portfolio of power generation, and it, primarily for the purpose of reducing costs, and to go through some best practices of initiating peaking and distributed generation uh, capabilities as you're working through these projects. Now, the whole concept of reciprocating engines is not new, um, and prime power applications have been in with uh, generator sets for, well, basically since the 30s and early 40s. And they have come to be known for their reliability and serviceability. Many people can work on these units, and the uh, support that is now available for these projects on a worldwide basis is what really keeps these things operating and what uh, most end users are really looking for. And the low life cycle costs of being able to provide those power sources on a local basis. Typical markets that you see these in are, are varying all over the world. And, you know, construction and mining are the things that typically come to mind. But the uh, reliability and uh, particularly for the quality power attributes as it's relating to communications and manufacturing or commercial businesses worldwide, and of course health healthcare services that we see with both uh, primarily diesel but a lot of gas products that go into these applications on a worldwide basis today. The electric utility business though is one where we've seen a lot of use of these gas resources. And the utilities are really interested in trying to retain customer uh, bases to be able to manage the spot prices and the volatility in those markets that they see. And as peak capacity continues to grow at much higher rates than what the base load is, it allows the utilities to take control over that peak capability. A lot of pressure uh, continues on a worldwide basis on utilities. And as you look here at the customer demand versus what the utility capability is to be able to provide the power necessary to be able to meet that customer demand, 
the only thing that is uh, for sure is that every utility will get into this situation, and it's simply a matter of when. So many utilities are in these situations where they're having a difficult time trying to meet that customer demand today. A lot of utilities that have excess capability or capacity, um, as their loads continue to grow, will put them in a pressure position to have to meet that, uh, that opportunity. Quality, power, and reliability are the things that people tend to look for the most, and that's where we see the reciprocating engines as being one of the very strong points, as well as the increasing demand that we see on a worldwide basis. With all of the people in the world today that have a need for power and the insatiable demand for energy as we see it um, developing on a worldwide basis, uh, the key is how do we get that next quality bit of power to these people in a reliable way, be able to meet their needs locally. There's a couple of different ways to do this. The installations that we typically see with these are permanent installations, facilities that are built to take care of the local needs. And sometimes these will be at uh, the, the uh, transmission points. Sometimes it will be actually at the uh, point of end use or out in the field a little bit. But um, to support the grid and, and whatever the need of that grid is, is the key of these permanent installations. We see a lot of the installations that could be quite a bit larger as well. You know, 40, 50 megawatt installations for uh, use online to be able to keep the power flowing is a, a very real thing, and we see these applications on a worldwide basis. Temporary installations are also important. If you have an, um, a need at a utility to change out infrastructure or to be doing work locally, uh, temporary installations is a very positive way to be able to take care and keep your customers' needs under control while you're doing the work on the system. Also, as you have new and um, growing areas that will exceed the growth rate of what your infrastructure can, these temporary installations can also be put in to be able to make sure that the power is available for the local sources and to be able to make sure that the quality power remains high quality uh, at all times. Why would we use distributed generation? What is the main purpose for this and how does it work? Well, basically it's a tool to be able to meet the customer's needs reliably, to make sure that they have the power they need to keep their infrastructure operating and to keep generating revenue, which is what this is all about, keep the jobs in place. Um, reduction of energy costs, not only for the utility in a way to be able to make sure that they are uh, getting the lowest cost energy, uh, but also to the end users to be able to make sure that the rates that they're paying are something that they can afford to pay, that they can continue to do the work in your area on your installation. The grid reinforcement and the grid reliability, uh, the use of these generator sets to maintain power factor or just uh, to be able to keep the voltage at the proper levels can be used very effectively in that way. And as we talked about before, the peak kilowatt capacities keep growing in many regions around the world and these resources can easily be used to uh, manage those uh, peak growth areas. We also see that there's a capitalization utilization that is very effective, particularly for the, at the utility levels, that lease options could be available to people who don't have the financial worth or the need to be able to acquire um, generation to have it there on a regular basis, on a long-term basis. But there's also the opportunity for revenues, significant revenues, particularly being able to, to work into the secondary uh, commodity market with um, playing down the peaks that you have, to be able to manage the, the cost of those peaks with gas resources that um, may not have been available to you before. So it's an ability for the utility to be able to differentiate that commodity, to be able to work on site, and to be able to provide the user with the, the, the growth and retention that they need and the growth and retention of these um, customers that the utilities are looking for on a long-term basis. This whole growth and retention thing is very important to the utility because as you are working to try to manage that long-term growth and to invest in that business and infrastructure, you have to be able to provide energy at a cost that's effective or you'll lose your customers. They'll move on to other locations where they can get more cost-effective energy. So being able to manage those costs and those responsibilities is a very big part of what utilities do long-term. 
The ability to be able to match the loads on these sites is very important because as you get a load that drops on, they're not just on a uh, very slow basis. They may come on in, in megawatt increments. And the ability to be able to match these loads with the distributed generation is a huge benefit. At low capital costs, very quick to install, oftentimes within four to six months, or if they're on a temporary basis, can be almost uh, overnight, literally. Environmentally compliant projects are easy to put in place and to be able to, um, to work with the local sources uh, through the distributors to be able to make sure that you have an environmentally compliant project that will be good for the utility and for the end users. The products that are here, um, particularly on these more modular units, are easily relocatable and in the event that you don't need them anymore, they're easily liquidated which again helps to control the uh, total owning and operating costs of the utility. The resource efficiency becomes an issue in many cases. And historically speaking, the power generation that we're talking about you know, from the electric utility, if it's coal-fired or nuclear or uh, most of those types of applications, range in the 30 35% resource efficiency as they're creating the power. Line losses and transformer losses oftentimes put that, um, that um, value or the, the ability of the resource efficiency down in that 23 to 27% range as it reaches the end use location. By being able to put the power generation on site, that resource efficiency can easily be in that 35 to 45% electrical range and that becomes very beneficial when it comes to the cost of the energy that you're trying to provide. So let's talk just a little bit about the load distribution and what that means. What do we have and how do we work with that? Every site that you go to, every utility and their total infrastructure, every facility that, has, that uses energy, every home that uses energy has a load profile. And if you look at this three-dimensional load profile, the x-axis or the day of the year is the 365 days of the year. The hour of the day or the y-axis is uh, basically the 24 hours of the day. And the z-axis would be the kilowatt use, the usage that you actually have on site. And all of, there isn't a place that just uses a flat amount of energy all the time. But what we do is try to find out what is happening on an hour-by-hour -hour basis every day of the month and every month of the year to understand the profile that you're looking at. In this case, the blue areas that you see in the lower levels there are areas of lower usage, and they tend to correspond to the lower cost of energy. The white areas or the peaks that we talk about are exactly what we talk about, the peaks of the electric utility. And those are, tend to be at the times when you have the largest loads. Now, depending on where you are in the country, depending on where you are in the world, uh, each one of these peaks may be different with the different applications that you have. So understanding what's going on locally becomes a very big part of what we're talking about here. And the utility has to try to determine what are these load resources that I've got to be able to handle this. And to do that, they'll oftentimes put them into a load distribution curve. So that on the x-axis on this chart, if you look at the 12 months or a period of time over the given year, you've got the relatively low cost of energy that's being distributed over time. But as you have the very short periods that the, you know, where the peaks were, those white mountain tops that we saw before, the higher those are and the more demand that there is regionally, the higher that cost of energy is going to be. And the key to success is trying to make sure that you can manage those costs, manage those peaks and the higher points on that load distribution curve. The lower levels of that load distribution curve are usually handled with base load reserves. These will be your nuclear or your coal-fired applications, your heavy hydro applications where you have large physical dams that have, um, have a lot of water resource to be able to provide those base loads. The base loads tend to come at very low cost to the, um, to the developer of the energy or the utilities, and uh, it then translates into relatively low cost to the users as well. The second level are your more intermediate resources, and those tend to be your uh, like turbine applications, large turbines, 100, 
200, 500 megawatt types of turbine systems. They'll be turned on and used for relatively long periods of time, but provide that next level of energy at a little bit higher cost, but still at a very predictable cost. The top part, or the peaking resource, tends to be all kinds of recip applications or microturbines or fuel cells or any kind of um, piece that you can get that, that's out there that will actually start working in these applications. And we see a number of these resources that will be put out on a local basis. And that's what we're talking about. How do you manage those costs and those higher applications? Now, the gas price, and as we start working with gas applications, the spark spread becomes a very important part of this application. And what we see is that the distance between the blue line, which is the cost of the natural gas, and that, um, that reddish color line, the pink line, is the cost of the retail electricity that's available to the marketplace. And so what we're trying to do is understand the value of these projects and to make sure that they're financially advantageous. You're trying to see spots where you can use the gas to be able to benefit the application. As you can see here in the, uh, toward the left side of this chart, back from basically the 1970s up through uh, basically 2000, there was a positive spark spread or differential cost between the price of gas and the price of electricity, allowing gas to be used as a, um, a fuel source that made a lot of sense, that you could make money by using gas assets and generating power to provide those, that power to the, um, to the grid for sale into the grid or for use by users against the grid. You can also see that from 2000 to about 2008, where the price of gas started to get fairly high, particularly in North America, and as the gas prices got higher, the spark spread became negative, or it was not advantageous to be able to use the uh, gas res resources to be able to generate power. What we've seen over the last uh, number of years is a decoupling of the gas prices and from the oil prices that we've traditionally seen, and the gas in the abundance that we've been able to find and unlock it um, on an international basis has um, caused the price of that gas to be something that is allowing us to be able to use that gas to be able to generate power on a long-term basis. And the prognosis is for this lower price gas to continue, which means that the spark spread should continue as well. So we expect to see that the differentiation between the gas and the electricity prices will continue to grow, which will allow even more applications of the gas resources in utility applications. If we look at a typical demand over a 24-hour period, traditionally it's been quite common to use diesel resources, very high power density, relatively low cost type products, to be able to provide the one to 500 hour a year type of peaking applications. Take the very highest points of that load demand curve and provide that to, um, and to be able to, to provide power to that curve and to take that curve off. To be able to level that cost, to know what the maximum cost of energy is, regardless of what's going on on the grid. So by understanding what your peak load was, making sure that you had enough kilowatts that were going to be available to be able to provide to take care of that peak. You were able to chop the top of that curve off, if you will, and basically lop it off so that you knew what your cost was going to be. You knew what that cost of energy was going to be at that highest point. These resources could easily be located at the facilities of end use or those facilities could are also be located at the site of, uh, of distribution. So coming in from the, um, the high tension lines, coming into the distribution grid, it was very easy for the utilities to provide that almost anywhere on the distribution side, but most oftentimes located or co-located with the area of transformation. So that the utility had control over this, this asset and could use it to control the cost to the end user, and that was the predominant way of use. Many times the utilities would work with the end users and allow them a rate structure that would make it economical for the user to be able to use those resources locally. In addition, those resources then would also be available to the end user for standby purposes as well. In the recent years, particularly the last uh, 15 years or so, we've seen a lot of use with the gas peaking. 
so that the lower cost of application of the gas engines, the lower cost of operation, and uh, lower cost of maintenance on these engines allow them an opportunity to be able to be more economical on a cents per kilowatt hour basis, particularly with the lower fuel prices that we see today. Uh, so that, that drives that resource down in terms of cost, which then allows you to move down that resource curve and be able to effectively lop off the, even more of that curve. So by using the gas reciprocating products, you can now hold your total, your maximum cost exposure to a much lower level. And that's what a lot of utilities and a lot of end users are doing. Just the same as what we saw on the, uh, with diesel resources, these resources can be located at the point of end use or can be located and co-located out with the electric utility at their distribution and in the distribution grid at some location. So very common that they will use these in these areas. And what we see then is that the resource efficiency, again, of these resources gets to be very high and it's very effective for users. Now, a third level or another level that we see is the uh, peaking with gas assets that also have combined heat and power resources. Another way to, yet again, use these resources to continually lower the cost of that application. This oftentimes allows these units to be applicable in upwards of 4,000 hours a year economically so that they can be operating online and doing the, uh, helping the utility with their uh, peak burden and at the same time helping lower the cost to end users. Now the combined heat and power basically is defined as the simultaneous and sequential use of power and heat from the same fuel source. And it could be something as simple as when you drive your car on a nice cold crispy morning. It's a matter of turning that uh, heater level in your car from the uh, blue side to the red side and taking the heat, the waste heat from your engine, instead of getting it blown out through the radiator, it gets actually put into your cab. That is actually cogeneration or the simultaneous and sequential use of power and heat, generating power for the wheels at first and then the heat into the source. The same thing is true with many applications that you see on in, in different locations. And what we find is that this is particularly useful um, to try to keep these power costs lower, to even lower the costs from the resource gas prices that what we had before. Because I'm getting benefit from the economics of this for heating or cooling in an application, um, that benefit can also then make the cost of energy lower yet and allows it to be online even longer than with just a straight gas resource. What we find is that with the much higher resource efficiency that's available, particularly at the point of end use, these applications can be um, done on a regular basis. And so we see them going into applications like in cooling uh, with uh, absorption cooling systems, in heating, in process heating, for plating and refinery plants, uh, in numerous applications where heat loads are required. These units can be put online to supplement the heat costs and to help uh, lower the overall operating costs of the facility and at the same time help the utility with their peaking load needs. If you look at municipal applications, uh, it's not uncommon, uh, particularly in Europe, to have district heating systems where these uh, power generation systems providing power to the uh, municipals, municipalities will also be using the heat to be able to heat and to, to cool those locations. The flexible power is a big deal, and it adds a lot of value to the services that a utility can provide to a user. By having these products available and we're working with rate structures to help users to be able to have these uh, systems located on their site, um, the utilities can add a lot of value to their services, differentiate their electrical commodity from other sources that might be available to that customer. It also allows you to provide long-term power contracts, both to help make sure that the user understands that this power is available and to make sure that the, um, that the user is getting the lowest in owning operating costs. And again, as a retention strategy for their customers in their territory, this makes a big difference. 
in one situation in a uh, location in southern U.S. here, there was a um, plating facility that was fixing to get up and to leave the states to go to a lower area because of the cost of energy. And when the electric utility went and co-located multiple generator sets on the site with that, um, with that plating facility, uh, the cost of energy for their application was low enough that they were able to retain them in their communities and to not have them move from their local source, which was huge for the community, a huge resource, and people that was, uh, have jobs in their community. So it was, a, it was a very large asset to that community by the utility working with them to be able to provide that power. And oh, by the way, the facility then also had standby power to be able to use in case of, of uh, an outage on the grid. The other part of this is the customer cost of downtime, and that's where that standby business comes in as well. The downtime is a, a big deal to users in particular in terms of wages, in terms of the quality of their products, and the revenue that they can receive from those products. It allows them to be able to maintain their production schedules and to be able to you know, maximize the customer satisfaction, which is what utilities are trying to do, is to take care of the needs of all of their users. From a utility perspective, the power quality services do, in fact, differentiate the commodity. And by using gas reciprocating engines in these applications, uh, many times this can be enhanced to the point where um, you can add a lot of value to the customer and maintain your product for that customer, the electrical power that you're providing to these folks. Uh, the enhanced marketing position with customers is, is great. And it promotes regional growth and attracts new businesses to all of these areas. Low-cost energy is a key to inviting new customers into your area and to, for customers to be able to maintain their business in your area. And the dual sourcing of standby and peaking capability is a big asset in all of these applications. Let's talk a little bit about understanding the purchase power and generation options that you have in these applications. So how do I know and how do I evaluate one of these situations? Well, the, understanding the cost of the existing wholesale and the new wholesale generation that you're looking at, is you need to understand that as a part of this. Transmission and distribution costs and capacities uh, is important. And evaluating self-generation sources is key, but the whole thing here gets wrapped around information. Do I know what kind of load growth and load information I have available to me? And if I have hourly data over five years, that is a big way to look at this. So this resource information is key, and understanding your energy supply and transport contracts is important, and knowing your electric delivery constraints. If I need more power and there are not enough wires to bring it in, that becomes problematic, and I have to find a way around that, and RECIPs can fix that problem. But also understanding this data on an averaging basis can be very damaging if you're not careful. And let me show you why. If I take a look at a month ahead forecasting, if I'm looking at the 24 hours a day, or if I'm looking at basically 24 hours a day as, it, as you go from left to right, and I'm looking at the 30 days of a month as I go from uh, the top to the bottom, the gray areas that you see is basically loads that are in balance, that are within plus or minus two megawatts, in this case, of what my balanced load is. The red items there are areas that I expect to be long. So my sources of energy are telling me that I'm going to have too much energy and it's going to be um, that I have to find some way to get rid of that energy. I have to either sell it on the market or let it go. The blue areas, though, are areas that I'm going to expect to be short by at least two megawatts. So by being short means I have to have some way to be able to meet the electrical needs in that area. So understanding how to deal with these situations becomes kind of a twofold proposition. One is taking a look at a resource plan, looking at the load resources, looking at my five-year projections, and applying the wholesale resources that I know that I have available to me locally to be able to fix the problem or to understand how I'm going to deal with it. The second part of this is the solutions and opportunity assessment. How can I use other resources, including reciprocating engines, to, to assist me in being able to make that work? If I'm looking at it from an hour load growth, you have to understand 
the, uh, the data that is available to you. Here on this chart, we're looking at basically the megawatts on the y-axis, on the x-axis, it's over time. And in this case, it goes from January 1, 2006 through May of 2011, so a five-year period that we're seeing. You notice first off that there is, in fact, a growth in load in this particular location. And I'm looking at hours 5, which is the lighter color, and the hour 19, which is the red or the higher peak numbers. And you notice that at the very beginning, my peaking side of this, or the, uh, the difference between my, my lighter load and my heavier load, is about 1.5 megawatts in terms of duration, or the difference between them at the beginning of that period. And it jumps to about 3.5 megawatts at the end, saying that my peaking need is growing farther and faster than what my base load is growing. And that becomes an issue. You have to deal with that issue. I also can now take a look at that load profile like we looked at before and recognize that I have to understand the time of day and the, the seasonal shapes of that electric load because that's going to be important for planning through our future. Understand that load. In this case, we're seeing that that load profile is significantly different. These two lo locations aren't but a couple of hundred miles away from each other, yet the peak loads are huge. On the earlier one, we had both a winter and a summer peak. On this one, we have a summer peak only. And that it is basically the law of supply and demand that says that the electricity is most expensive when everybody needs it, and it's going to be worth very little when nobody needs it. From there, we're going to take a look at a base load. So if I'm going to buy a block of energy, I'm going to buy... In this case, we can, might say five megawatts of energy that I'm going to use to put on my grid. And I'm going to buy it for 24 hours a day. I'm going to buy it for seven days a week, 365 days a year. And if I'm at the 100% load point, that cost, at say, if I'm buying it at $55 a megawatt hour and I'm having a $6 transmission charge, that's going to leave me a cost of right at that $61 a megawatt hour that you can see on the far left of that screen. Now, if I take that resource and I use that only at a 50% load, that's going to take that energy that I'm paying for, and I'm, it's going to drive the cost of that energy to $122 a megawatt hour. So just by simply not using that energy, I'm going to be, it's going to be costing me quite a bit more for that energy on a cost per kilowatt hour basis that I'm actually going to be able to use or from an electric utility perspective that I'm actually going to be able to sell. In this case now, we're looking at remarketing that energy that I don't use. If I can't use half of that energy at my 50% point, then I'm going to be able to sell that back. But chances are I'm not going to be able to sell it back at the same price I'm buying it for. If you can get anything at all, in this case, we're going to assume that we're going to get $35 a megawatt hour for this. So now my cost for that energy at the 50% point is going to be at about 50 or $87 a megawatt hour. So my cost, though better than what it was by not reselling the energy, is still more than what I paid for. Now, if you notice as you get back into yet lighter loads, that becomes even more expensive. Now, if I put a gas resource, a reciprocating resource in, this blue line represents the cost that I'm going to be able to fix with that cost. This includes my owning and operating costs. So I'm assuming for the sake of this argument that I've got $7.50 per million BTU of fuel used and that I've got about a $14.50 per megawatt owning operation and maintenance costs on the system. Even there, you can see as you get down into that 30% range, now all of a sudden I've got a resource that is actually equal to the cost of being able to buy that peak load or that firm price load. And so now I can actually provide energy at this level and can provide it with a reciprocating resource at or below that cost, particularly as you start moving up that peak. So if my load factor goes down, my reciprocating resources now becomes more valuable to me. Okay, let's talk about some best practices and how these work when it, as it relates to distributed generation and peaking plant analysis. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at is what resources are available to us. 
What contracts do we have in place today, and how long will these contracts last? Can I get another contract that is advantageous, that's at a price that makes sense to me? And how much does transmission cost to get that energy from the point that it's being developed to the point that I want to try to use it? So understanding your resource capabilities and resources that are available to you become very important in this application. I also take a look at self-generation resources. In this case, the uh, user has um, applications or engines on site, and there are multiple different types of resources. So what is my total capacity, and what is the total capacity that I need? How do I dispatch it? What do I do to be able to make sure that I'm going to be able to, to provide it at the right time? Look at it at the cost every hour, um, have people that are involved in this. What environmental constraints do we have that are there? And the other things that we need to pay attention to are these capacity factors and the capacity of the generators on site. If I'm at elevation or at extremely high ambient temperatures, I may have to derate some of those resources. And whether they be reciprocating engines or turbines or any other asset, all of that has to be done, which may also have an effect on the heat rate that I'm looking at. So when you're looking at your resources, make sure that we know and understand what those costs are. In addition, we need to understand what's included in the maintenance costs. And in this case, the maintenance costs includes the cost of the generator set, the switch gear, and all of the facility charges that go along with it in order to maintain that facility. So all of that becomes important as we're working through these projects. What we're looking for at the end of the day is basically taking the fuel costs that you see in the third column from the end, you're taking your maintenance costs, which you've identified from before, and you're adding that together to come up with a strike price on a dollar per megawatt hour basis. That strike price is the value of the energy asset that you've got access to and what it costs for you to put that online. So in theory, any energy that you're going to have to buy from the grid that is above that point you'll want to strike your own resource to be able to make sure that you can provide that energy at a lower cost than what the grid can provide that energy for you. And that becomes very valuable to you. So now I'm going to be taking a look at also my annual loads on my load distribution. Again, I've got both winter and summer peaks that are here, and we also know that if I'm going to be short on resources during peak load periods, I have to understand what the price of that peak load resource is going to be. Because where does the strike price compare to that high price? Conversely, if I'm long on assets, what is the lowest part of lowest point of those kilowatt hour costs going to be? What is that pricing going to be on the low side? So that I know when to shut my generation off and when to buy energy from the grid because it is more economical for me to be buying the energy off of the grid. Understanding what the seasonal peak loads are is important as well, and understanding the trend is every bit as important. Here you can see a, a time frame that ran from uh, over a five-year period where the, uh, where the peak was growing at a pretty rapid rate. And not only the summer peak, but the winter peak were both growing, and the summer peak was growing faster than the winter peak. So understanding how fast your loads are growing makes a big difference in terms of understanding what the value of that distributed generation asset is going to be to you. How much do I need to put on? What's the value of it? Now, in addition to understanding the peak loads and where they are, the time of day that they occur becomes every bit as important. If you look at the x-axis here in terms of the time of day, I've got the 24 hours of my day. I've got my y-axis being my month of the year. And if we notice then that the, um, that the red dot points are going to be the highest point or the place where I'm growing the greatest happens to be growing at a time in the early morning hours where I probably have enough base load to be able to buy it or that the energy on the grid is going to be low enough cost that it makes more sense for me to worry about that growing peak in my, um, in my time. Next, though, and the one that's more important is that fast-growing peak between the hours 15 and basically 20, 24. And it tends to be growing in the month of basically June, July, and August. And so that one is the one that's going to cause the most problem because I'm going to be hitting that at peak periods, and that's going to be the most expensive kilowatts to try to take care of. 
So that extremely fast expanding peak becomes very important for us to understand and to be able to figure out how do we take that off with the reciprocating engines or the other assets that I might have. So let's take a look at applying some of these practices as we're getting into this. Take a look at the current stacked resource that you've got. And typically those stacked resources are going to be stacked in economic ways so that my cheapest cost of resource is going to be the lowest in the stack so that I can have my lowest cost of energy that is always going to be at the um, used all the time. That's the one that you want. Now, the other thing that we have to understand is, are some of these renewable resources? Because if I'm looking at, say, wind or solar as a renewable resource, it may be that those resources are not going to be available to us all of the time. And so do we have a way to firm them or to back those resources to make sure that we have a way to be able to, um, to uh, take care of that resource and to make sure that it's available if it, in fact, is supposed to be available? So understanding what your backup resources that are available are is very important. In addition, if I'm looking at my stacking, I've got my wind and hydro at those lower levels. I've got my coal at that next level up. But my shaped products or the ability to be able to conform to whatever my load profile is turning out to be, being able to turn multiple shafts on and off, multiple engines on and off, to be able to meet those demands is going to be important. But understanding what the peak demand that I'm expecting is important as well. In this case, on this particular load, uh, we're looking at about a 12.5 megawatt energy shortfall that we've got to find a way to take care of. And I can take a look then and decide whether it makes economic sense to be able to do that with reciprocating engines, 100% of that, or whether half of that with reciprocating engines, half of that going out to the grid is going to be beneficial to us. There's going to be a mix that's going to be right, that's going to make the most economic sense and offer the greatest security for that local source. That's the number, and that's what we're trying to get to. So what we also need to understand is what time of year or what season those peaks are in. Here we can see where we've got three different um, levels. The fall and spring tend to be the same, and so the shoulder months, if you will. There's a relatively short amount of, of reciprocating or other assets that I'm going to need to bring in play in order to be able to take care of those. During my winter months, though, my demand gets up significantly higher. So if you follow that brown line around that winter month, I'm going to have to try to figure out when to use that. And you notice that time of day does make a difference. So I have a peak in the morning at about that 7 o'clock time frame. I've got another fairly wide peak that starts about 1,700 hours or 5 o'clock and goes until about 10 p.m. or 2,200 hours that evening. So it, you have to be able to take care of that entire peak. Notice, though, that in this case, my summer is actually higher than all of those other peaks. And so what was driving that 12.5 megawatts was, in fact, my summer peak load. So it's only going to be happening during basically a month of the year, maybe two, and that peak is going to be higher than what my winter peak is. And, oh, by the way, probably the rest of the region is going to be on peak at the same time, meaning that the energy that I would buy off the grid is going to be very expensive during those peak hours. And that's when you can determine the value of that reciprocating resource. How valuable is that to you, and, and what difference does it make to you? So that summer peak, as I mentioned, is, is going to be the key to this, and that's going to be driving that 12.5 megawatt um, period that we're there. Okay, so in finishing that conversation or figuring out what that cost of power to, to take care of that peak is going to be, you're basically going to be doing a couple things. One is taking a look at the delivered cost of purchased power. So electric energy that I'm buying plus the transmission costs less any resold energy that I may have access to. So if I'm buying a block of energy and I'm not using it all and I, need to res and I can resell some of that into the, into the marketplace, what value do I think I can get for that energy as I'm reselling it? So that the cost of those two combined becomes my cost of delivered purchase power. My cost of generated power revolves around the operation and maintenance costs of the generator set and specifically the cost of fuel. 
it's not uncommon that the cost of fuel will represent somewhere between 65 and 90 percent of your total owning and operating costs of the generator set. So paying attention to what the fuel costs are and getting access to a long-term fuel contract so you can fix those costs can be a very valuable thing to you. And what you're doing at the end of the day is comparing the costs. And what we find is that it all ends up being about the contract load factor. So what is the load factor of my system? And how do I use that energy? And the key to success is going to be how many kilowatt hours can I use with um, generating energy with less expensive power. And that less expensive power may be coming from a distributed asset. So making that decision may well change your resource loading. And if you're putting gas engines in, as that red area would indicate, to be able to take care of kilowatt hours on that peaking side, what you're doing is adding reliability and reducing costs. The reliability is getting, being beneficially affected by both dual sourcing, so you do have a backup with the grid being able to provide you with something. But more importantly, you've got multiple shafts that you can be running, multiple crankshafts, multiple engines that can be turned on and off and can then protect your load source to make sure that you're operating at the most economical place possible. Now, there are many different applications and ways you can do this. And here you can see a uh, diesel and natural gas combination as well as coal. So in this case, there's um, three gas reciprocating engines, five diesel engines, and then a coal and gas 60 megawatt facility that's all tied together to be able to do summer peaking and price hedging. So it's not uncommon to mix resources. You don't have to have one or the other because if you have an issue with diesel resourcing or if the price of diesel goes way up, you can rely more closely on your natural gas or coal or other resources. So mixing resources becomes a very valuable thing to do. In some cases, you can have extremely large distribution systems all tied together. Here in, in France, for example, there's over 800 megawatts of district heating cogeneration all on the same grid, and that's all tied together. And so it, you're not talking about necessarily small megawatt installations. You can have extremely large megawatt installations as well. And the industries where these things can be used uh, can be very, uh, from a resource perspective, is, is almost infinite. The oil refineries or refineries of all different types, industrial applications, hospitals, utilities, um, universities, all these places have a good reason to be putting these assets on site and using them for long-term benefits. So what are the key points of all this? First off, that distributed generation resources are viable in most utility applications. They make economic sense, and that becomes important. They can be located either with existing facilities or at user sites or on independent sites as long as they have access to the grid, it doesn't matter where they're located, but they can be brought in and SCADA controlled to be able to tie them together. Understanding the simple questions can yield great results in these things, and understanding the historical data and the direction it's going, whether it's being uh, your loads are increasing or even decreasing, can have a factor on this. And the key to success is that it's all about the load factors on these projects. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time. And now, Nick, if you'd like to uh, take over. Absolutely. I uh, appreciate your time, and hope folks stick around here. we got some Q&A coming up as well as some, some last-minute poll questions. But, Mike, let's just get right to it. And those who want to submit their question, who still have time to receive that, please go ahead. Uh, first question I have here is from Edmund at Equinix, and he asks, he asks, do you see data centers using distributed generation technologies? Uh, today, data centers are, have um, large resources of, of engines on site, and they're doing so uh, primarily as a second source, so it's back up, it's energy use. As far as natural gas is concerned, it could be a very valuable resource, and it could be a great way to minimize your cost. The combined heat and power in, in these data centers, one of the biggest loads you know, beyond the specific data equipment is the cooling load. And the combined heat and power capabilities of these gen sets can be a very strong asset in, in that. And mixing particularly with the diesel and gas resources on those sites as your backup sources that you're doing today anyway could be a very positive way to be able to uh, improve your economic picture on site. 
Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, next question here comes from an audience member who asks, does CAT themselves utilize distributed generation assets in their facility? Sort of a, are you putting your money where your mouth is, I guess, uh, question here, Mike. Um, many of our facilities do. And um, in Lafayette facility, which is where we're located here, we have six uh, generator sets that are on site that are doing uh, peaking uh, applications. Uh, we're in the process of building a new visitor center in our Peoria, on our main area, and that's going to uh, have featured in it uh, not only the uh, gas engine driven chillers and the chiller applications that we've got on site there locally, but we're also putting in combined heat and power resources to be able to heat and cool that facility. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm noticing some questions coming in here specific to environmental regs and compliance. Um, the first, I guess, series of questions here, this is from Jeff at Verdigris Energy. Can you comment on the environmental, environmental regs, particularly in non-attainment areas, and how does this impact distributed generation? Well, obviously, the emissions issue is a key issue as it relates to, to the engines. Uh, most of these engines meet, um, for example, in North America, uh, new source performance standards, so the NSPS regulations. Uh, the gas engines uh, come nominally at either um, one gram or half gram NOx levels. Um, local resource requirements, though, may require additional work. In some areas, particularly as you go in altitude, it's not uncommon that aldehydes or uh, CO may become issues or um, unburnt hydrocarbons, which there's very few of on a natural gas engine, but it, uh, you do have some issues there, and where you can do a simple oxidation catalyst to be able to take care of that. And, of course, there are other um, technologies that are available to get even tighter regulations if those are required. But understanding the regulation and knowing what you've got locally is obviously a key to success. You have to know your regulation, understand what you've got, and whether there's any um, uh, to know whether you've got the ability to be able to meet those needs. And in most cases, we can find technologies and an economical way to be able to make that work. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I have a question from Michael asking, again, sort of about compliance. He says, well, environmental compliance can be worked out at a cost, but the, his biggest concern is using a uh, resource, say an emergency resource, let's say a life, safe, life safety resource, for load shedding and load peaking and the code issues that may arise with that. Is that something you can kind of speak in general terms to, Mike? Yeah, most of the life safety um, devices are going to be diesel in nature. It's not common to have gas because most of the life safety require that you have on-source fuel sources. And so, you know, that may be problematic to have enough fuel to be able to run a large natural gas system in particular for extended periods of time. You know, if it's 100 kW, 200, you know, a propane system or uh, even an LNG, CNG type system may work, uh, but it's more common that you're going to see diesel resources in life safety. Now, on the other side, to have it as standby, um, you know, if you take a look at what happened in New Orleans when they had uh, Katrina go through there, uh, of the hospitals, they had numerous hospitals that went down. I think there were nine hospitals there total, four of them I think went down totally because they were on diesel systems. The other uh, had combined heat and power systems that were available, and even underwater, the pipeline was able to bring the gas to those systems. Those hospitals still had the availability of standby. So what we are seeing is that in a standby situation, we're seeing many times now where um, they're trying to get multiple sources of fuel, both diesel and gas, on site, not just one, not just the other, but multiple sources to be able to take care of those situations. Thanks, Mike. We've got a flood of questions now coming in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Here we'll maybe go a couple minutes long, and if we cannot answer your question, we will respond after the webcast via email. So, Mike, can you compare the total owning and operating costs, diesel versus natural gas-fueled uh, reset technology? This is from Thomas at Power Concepts. Um, the cost of the technology itself, uh, you know, if I'm looking at the cost per kilowatt of a generator first installed cost, the gas is going to be uh, probably 10, 15 percent, maybe higher than what the diesel will be on a first cost basis. Where the gas engines make up, though, on it is the total owning and operating costs. Because of the, and, and that is going to be driven a lot by the cost of fuel. If we're talking $3 gas today, like we do, uh, $3 per million BTU, 
um, the cost of operating a natural gas engine is going to be significantly lower than that of what a diesel engine at you know, $3, $2.5 a gallon um, diesel is going to cost. So if I'm looking at long hours, if I'm looking at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hours a year or more, uh, the more hours you get, the more advantageous it gets to go looking at the gas engine at the cost of that engine. Thanks, Mike. Um, Jim Hawthorne from Frontier Projects Canada asks, are there any examples of independent power producers or IPPs using recip engine gensets? Oh, there are quite a few of them, actually, um, that, that use engines. Um, and a lot of it, if you look at the real-time pricing areas, those are the areas where they have tended to go first because, as we were going through here, that's where it makes the most economic sense. If the um, utility or the user is working in a real-time or the cost of the next kilowatt in the next hour is what you're going to pay, you know, whatever it costs to, to build that or to make that kilowatt is what you're going to pay, that's when you can start making some really good choices on whether to use recips or not. If I'm on a fixed rate and it's a fixed X cents a kilowatt, then it becomes just simply a installed cost and what's the cost of gas on that day or you know, at that time or that contract. And that becomes uh, less advantageous in many cases. But the closer you are to real-time pricing or paying the actual cost of that next kilowatt, the more advantageous looking at these reciprocating resources makes sense. And Mike, more questions on the cost side. I see several questions um, alluding to both micro turbines and gas fire turbines. When does the reciprocating engine win out versus those other technologies on a cost of installation or cost of operation side? Well, if I'm looking at turbines, um, the place where turbines really shine is when, it, when you have combined heat and power and I have a very high quality need for heat. So if I need 200 PSI steam if I, and I need a lot of heat energy uh, as well as a lot of electrical energy, you know, the bigger sites, uh, turbines can start to make a lot of sense. The other thing is that what we find is that when you put the turbines on site and you mix them with gas recip assets, use the recips to take the, uh, the load swings, use the turbines for the block load and the base load, if you will, and the... Um, uh, ability to be able to pick up that high quality heat can make a big difference there. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, yeah, Mike, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to uh, end the webcast here because we're out of time. The questions, again, once, we, once again, that we didn't get a chance to answer, we will respond to. We would appreciate your help if you could just stick around and ask or answer just a couple more questions for us, and we'd certainly appreciate it. First is sort of along the lines of your experience level with Caterpillar in this business. Um, secondly, we'd like to ask you how you would rate the uh, information that was provided to you today. Uh, we hope you got something out of it. We hope it was valuable for you, and we'd certainly appreciate if you could submit your answer on, on this question. And then finally, uh, before we let everybody go, um, one more question that we'd like to ask is, uh, do you see a business case for this technology? Based on what you heard today uh, during this webcast, has, has anything in your mind changed? We'd be curious to know. Uh, we certainly see a lot of opportunities out there. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and end the webcast. I want to thank our speaker, Mike Devine, as well as the supporting cast here uh, back at Caterpillar for uh, supporting the event today. Uh, we appreciate your attendance, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you in our next webcast. Right now we're looking uh, at the uh, June-July time frame to do a webcast on biogas applications. But thank you for your attendance today, and we're signing off here from Caterpillar.